There is nothing quite like hiking through wonderful scenic places that have well-exposed geology. It gives one an opportunity to ponder the long, wonderful history of our Earth. The formations of rock I'm hiking along between these two lines were deposited over about a 50 million year period from 150 to 100 million years ago and happen to be some of the most iconic in all the world. It was during the time of their deposition that many, many dinosaurs lived, died, and were buried by thousands of feet of sediment that much later eroded away to reveal their bones. Easily 90% or more of all dinosaur bones found in North America come from these layers. In northwest Wyoming, they're named the Morrison and Cloverley Formations. Walking along, I see something that catches my eye in the distance. A large hill that seems out of place in the landscape, and it rises from the very layers that I'm hiking on. Well, this is interesting. It's a mysterious sandstone monument that juts up from underneath and most certainly has secrets of the dinosaur world to reveal to us. Let's hike to the top and make some observations. Hello, I'm Myron Cook. I'm sure glad to be out here with you uh, exploring the geology of our wonderful planet. What a beautiful place we live in. And this is a, a wonderful place. I'm north of Grable, Wyoming, along the western flank of Sheep Mountain Anticline. And it's here where rising seemingly out of nowhere is this great monument of sandstone. And these giant boulders strewn about, some of them in places that seem hard to figure out as to how they got there. What are they doing there? And of course, this is the land of the dinosaurs, this period of where all these rocks are. And you have to wonder what impact, if any, did this strange formation have on the dinosaur population? Standing near the top of this amazing sandstone monument, it really makes my uh, geology brain whirl and whiz thinking about this landscape and the, the dinosaurs running around and thinking about why this is here. What is it? What created this? And how did these boulders get way out there? And of course, to figure all that out, we need to make some observations, don't we? So onward we go. I spot a large boulder that provides me clues as to the origin of the sandstone. Looking closely, you can see dipping layers parallel to the blue line and between flat layers parallel to the red lines that I've drawn. These depositional features are referred to as planar tabular cross stratification. This indicates to me that the sandstone was deposited by wind or water and flowed in the direction of the arrow. These ripple marks on this large boulder indicate wind or water deposition, most likely water, and it would have only been a few inches deep. I've come to a place that's pretty interesting. We can see these boulders and how they're strewn about and some of the interesting places they're in. Let me show you. Looking at the peak above, as we pan around and come down the steep slope, we see these big boulders strewn about, beautiful sandstone boulders. Down into the bottom of this pretty amazing draw, a deep draw, and then back up the other side and you see these big boulders clear on the other side of the draw. That's pretty interesting. From above we can see these relationships better. The bottom of the draw runs right along this blue line with a substantial ridge on the left side. Notice all the large boulders strewn along the back side of the ridge. How did they get there? Could it be that large pieces of the sandstone monument broke away rolled down the steep slope and carried enough momentum to roll up and over the ridge? If so, why aren't there more boulders in the bottom of the draw? These are the kind of questions I love to think about. And these boulders are quite large. I hiked to this interesting one. Let's take a look.
This big guy is soon going to fall off its pedestal. The day is drawing to a close. Beautiful, quiet, peaceful out here. I'm standing here in front of this wonderful sandstone monument, and it turns out there's something else that's very interesting about it. And I want to show some things to you with the drone. They're a bit difficult to see, but if you look closely, you can see faint horizontal red lines cutting across the sandstone. Looking at the other end, they're a bit more obvious. I spotted a feature on Google Earth that I think will help us unravel the puzzles we've encountered. And to get there, I drove one of my favorite roads right up the nose of the iconic Sheep Mountain Anticline. This area is truly inspiring to me. It gives me many opportunities to contemplate so much about our Earth's history, and it's so beautiful. The monument we explored is here, and the feature that caught my eye is this flatter area right here. Hiking over a ridge, I see the area for the first time, and sure enough, just as I expected, it is an impressive layer of sandstone. What a beautiful area. Amazing country, isn't it? Man, I feel so fortunate to be able to come out here and hike around in these vast open spaces and see this geology. And in particular, hiking to this sandstone here. It, the coloring within it is, is really quite amazing. I want to come back and do some photography. The hike was longer than I was expecting, so I'm running out of light. Uh, but wow, just really neat place. Now, as I've hiked around and seen this sandstone as I've hiked up to here, uh, I see very similar features to what I saw in the, in the Great Sandstone Monument. But here it's not standing up on end and jutting up into the sky. It's, it's pretty lo fairly low dip is what I would say. And I think these are related and now it's like, well, how does that happen? How can it be that we have a sandstone that's about 2,000 feet wide here uh, coming out of the, gently dipping and then we have the great monument over clear on the other side of the mountain. How do they tie together? We're going to figure that out. Many people would find this area to be a great place to explore and hike around in, enjoying the beauty that surrounds them. But in my view, without contemplating the history and geology they are traversing, they are missing out on another level of profound enjoyment and amazement. This relatively ordinary exposure of sandstone is providing me an opportunity to unravel mysteries and ponder the age of dinosaurs. Notice that the sandstone goes underground into the hillside right along the dashed red line. Looking carefully, you can see the edge of the sandstone body right here. There is none to be seen to the left along this hillside. Also, you can see the edge here on the right side. Again, there's no more sandstone to the right along the hillside. The width from edge to edge is about 2,000 feet. As you will recall, the monument has a similar constrained width. These observations indicate that the sandstone body has a long and narrow shape. So with these observations, it's clear to me that these two sandstone bodies were at one time connected together. And to better understand this, let's review the structural and erosional history of the rock formations. The many thousands of feet of rock layers that were originally flat lying were folded in dramatic ways about 65 million years ago and then eroded to their present configuration.
I've put in a red line to show the top of the cloverleaf formation, which is where the sandstones reside, and show how it was folded prior to erosion. Now I'm sure you've noticed that the layers of rock bend around a corner here, along the nose of the fold. To understand that better, watch my video on mountain making and folding rocks. Now that we've established this is a long and narrow sandstone body, we start to have fun. We think about where do we deposit sandstone bodies like this. And to help us out with that, I've got my whiteboard. And this is a map view. Uh, looking down from above, I've put in the ocean here with my fancy little wave symbols. And then, of course, this would be land up through here. And we're familiar with beaches. You've walked along a beach. And we know that, I'll put some dots here, the sand is fairly constrained along the beach, at least what we see is. And it seems to be a narrow band of sand along the beach. Well, that's a reasonable hypothesis, of course. Um, but it turns out that beaches almost always deposit blankets of sand, not narrow bodies. Uh, through time, they, they spread out a blanket of sand. That's another discussion. So this, for a geologist, you go, well, there are cases where you can get isolated beach sands that are narrow, but it's pretty unusual. So you kind of think about this, I uh, think, I'm not so sure, but let's keep it there. Well, those of you that are familiar with the ocean and oceanic processes know about barrier islands and spits, they call them, spit bars. Kind of a strange name. So if we have longshore currents, meaning waves that are coming in at an angle, when it comes to a point along a bay here or something, or it doesn't even have to be a bay, a point of land, it starts building out a sandbar that comes out like this into a spit. or Sometimes the bar goes clear across the bay or the lagoon, and they're called barrier island bars. So those are certainly narrow and can be quite long bodies of sand. And 2,000 feet wide, that seems pretty reasonable. So that's a very viable hypothesis. And the last option that we'll entertain for now is a river deposit. Of course rivers are long and fairly narrow. And we know dinosaurs were running around on the land out here, so let's put in a river. So I'll have a river coming down to the ocean right here. Okay, so now we have a, a river coming through and depositing sand. So which option is it? Well, as I've mentioned, the beach thing is kind of unusual, pretty unlikely. What about the spit bar and the barrier island bar? Well, Geologists can look at the sedimentary structures or the depositional features within the sandstones, and they also look at the deposits adjacent to the sand and just underneath and just above, and they take all that information and they can determine if it's marine, deposited in a marine environment, or in particular whether it's a barrier island bar, for example. And after doing that work, it's a no. No. It's not a marine deposit like that. So we're left with the river. Fairly straightforward, huh? And in fact, it's a river and they see evidence, geologists do, of some marine influence, some tidal influence within that river. So that tells us it's likely within a few miles of the, ocean, uh, of the actual shoreline. Now we have the full picture. It's a sandstone deposited within a fairly large river system. After all, it's about 2,000 feet wide. Pretty big river likely through here, coming down towards the shoreline of the ocean. This is pretty neat to think about. And then you think about the structural history and how it got warped. Now I want you to take a minute and think about your favorite river that you like to float down or maybe hike along. Imagine that river in the future being bent, warped, in a giant uplift and fold like a giant roller coaster that we see here. Even turning vertical, being vertical in parts, or very near vertical. That is crazy to think about, isn't it? Wow, so the river sandstone deposits were uplifted and folded and were nearly vertical on the left side of the fold before being eroded down. 
That's really hard to get your head around. Furthermore, the cross stratification we have observed indicates that the river flowed from left to right. Now to the interesting distribution of the large boulders scattered about. The whiteboard will certainly help us with that. So I've drawn a cross-sectional sketch. I have a tree here to help us understand that. We're looking sideways. This is the sandstone monument here. This is the ground surface here. So I could put another tree over here. Uh, these are boulders that are breaking free from this monument as it erodes and weathers down. Uh, these two blue lines I want you to ignore for the moment. So let's go back in time. Let's go back 50,000 or 100,000 years. This is the surface, and this is the way it looked like in my sketch here, say 50 to 100,000 years ago. The boulders are breaking free through time off this monument and slowly working their way down the, this hillside. Remember, these are mudstones. And big boulders that get on those tend to raft or almost... Not, I call it float. They don't float, but they raft down the hill or creep along very slowly. So in my observations out there, I don't think these boulders roll very far at all. They break off and then they creep or raft down the, the, the mudstone through time. So that's the situation 50 to 100,000 years ago. Now let's think about what happens as it erodes down. And that's why I have these two blue lines here. This is a future position of the land surface. So let's go to this side first. Erosion is taking that down through time. And of course it is on this side too. And the monument, everything is working down through time. So, and these boulders, they creep down the slope and they're going down. So let me take just one boulder and we're going to go through time to the present day. Let's say this big boulder right here. So this comes from, as I mentioned, 50 to 100,000 years ago, what it looked like. Through time, that boulder diagrammatically is following this arrow. Down, down, down. Let's say it comes down right to there. It's creeping down the slope and it's going down because of erosion. The two combined, that boulder works its way from here to here. <clears throat> and, and these other boulders, of course, are all on the, this side of that, working down. And now through time, these boulders start to disintegrate. The further out, you know, that means it took them a long time to get there, and eventually they just disintegrate or weather away. But another key point is there was a canyon or a draw that started to develop sometime between here and here. <clears throat> and it developed this, this draw. But the big boulders on this side of the draw, they got there through the creep process through time and got to over to here. They didn't roll down off the monument, down the slope, and up to the other side. To make this abundantly clear, I'm going to do erosion. I'm going to bring my eraser in here and erode this down right to there. Take all that out. Take my little arrows out here. Take my tree out, the whole thing, and redraw what the world looks like today. I'll put the top here, the sandstone, in red. I probably should put it in black. Uh, we have the monument. We have big boulders that are falling off today. And then starting to work down the slope, there are a few in the canyon here. And then we have these boulders on the other side of this draw. Who would have thought that boulders could be so interesting? Another important point to make is that the monument exists in part due to differential erosion. The thick sandstone is quite durable and erodes more slowly than the surrounding formations, which are dominated by soft shales. It's been fun using the scientific method to make sense of the geology we observe, but we still have perhaps the greatest mystery to explore. Why are these horizontal lines scattered throughout the sandstone? I've sketched this cross-sectional view of the monument that we have standing up above the ground here, 
and the dashed lines show the sandstone underneath the ground. And let me put in a few of these horizontal lines that we see scattered across the face of the monument. Now, this is quite a puzzle. And I, if you think about it, what are the options that we could have? What creates horizontal lines in rock? The first one that we immediately always think about is just the naturally uh, occurring layers within the rock. The thin, they can be very thin, or you can have thick beds. But we have to reject that just like that, because we know the bedding isn't this direction. It's actually that direction, because the layers of rock are all tipped and go up and over the mountain this way. So they're, they're in the completely wrong orientation to be just the natural layering or bedding within the rock. So that means we've got to think of something different. Let's just think a minute about what is horizontal. What around us do we think of that's horizontal? You know, sometimes I'm working on a project, building a project or something, and I need to know if something's level. And I don't have a level around to, to prove that or show that. And a few times over the years, I haven't done this much, but a couple times, I've done something really simple. Let me show you. Yep, I have taken a glass of water, and I use the top surface of that water, and I look along the top of it to tell if something's horizontal. Because, of course, the surface is horizontal of, in water, and I don't have to worry about how I'm tipping the glass or anything. So kind of a handy little thing to do. And that, turns out, is the key to the horizontal lines here in this sandstone. Indeed, sandstones are great aquifers or reservoirs for water to be held within underground. And based on a nearby river, the Bighorn River, I estimate that the water is likely somewhere about 200 to 300 feet down in the sandstones. Let's just put it right here. This isn't very horizontal, but that should be absolutely horizontal. Water filled in the sandstone. Like I said, two to three hundred feet down. Now, the chemistries of these groundwaters can change through time. So let's imagine that right now, the chemistries of the groundwater right here at the water table are such that they are removing the iron staining from the sandstone. That's fairly common, actually. It's removing the hematite staining and make them a lighter color. And that's creating a stripe across the sandstone down underground. And what really gets fun to think about is now, with that knowledge, you look and you see the highest stripe that you can notice up here on the monument, and you know that it was two to three hundred feet, maybe deeper, underground at the time that it was formed. And that the whole surface of the land, everything has been eroded that much to this present level uh, through that time. We know that rivers had a significant impact on the lives of dinosaurs, especially the larger rivers. Now, I've made a sketch here with the ocean, with my waves here, map view looking down, the ocean and a river coming down. And let's say we have dinosaurs running around. Of course we did. And at times they went across the river. And we know this could be a treacherous undertaking because Many times, if not most of the time, when we find large collections of dinosaur bones, it's the dinosaurs that got caught up in the river and drowned and, and washed down the river and got stuck, kind of like a log jam of, of trees and material that we see today. Dinosaur National Monument in Utah is a prime example of this, and it happens to be in the very same layers of rock that we have been exploring. Not only that, they are steeply dipping river deposits. They've found thousands of bones that collected in the ancient river. I highly recommend visiting this site. I never cease to be amazed by the profound history of our planet and that with a few basic skills we can decipher the stories left behind in the rocks. Who could have imagined that this monument is a river into the sky? that it was once a source of life and danger for dinosaurs living in lush forests along its banks. 
that the river died and was buried by thousands of feet of sediment over millions of years and then was uplifted from the depths to be revealed to you and me. Well, I've sure enjoyed making this video and I hope it's been an adventure for you. Thank you for watching.